Thank you all for uh, being here uh, today ahead of uh, this holiday week. On behalf of President Obama and the entire My Brother's Keeper Alliance and Obama Foundation families, welcome to our Reimagining Policing Virtual Workshop series, hosted in partnership with our colleagues and friends at Cities United, uh, and the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. This series, as you know, is designed to provide educational tools and analysis on the spectrum of policing and public safety options, alternative public safety models, and community-centered review processes. I also want to take a minute before we go uh, any further to acknowledge that November is Native American Heritage Month. Uh, the month is a time to celebrate the rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories, uh, and to acknowledge the important contributions of Native people. I want to share that I'm joining you from Alexandria, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. region, which is the ancestral land of the Anacostans, also sometimes known as the Pamunkey uh, tribe and Nacochetank, and over time uh, neighboring the Piscataway and Pamunkey peoples, where thousands of indigenous brothers and sisters thrived prior to colonization. We speak their names, we honor their memories, and we commit ourselves to the continued fight for equity, dignity, and justice for indigenous peoples everywhere. Uh, during today's workshop, we've brought together leading practitioners in the fields of data science and public safety to provide you with insight into how robust data collection and transparency can be the cornerstone of safe communities. Uh, we hope that you will walk away with perspective on best practices, tools, and opportunities for communities, police departments, and elected officials to work together to leverage data while ensuring the civil liberties of historically marginalized groups. It is now my honor to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Tracy Kazee, who is the co-founder and senior, direct, senior vice president of Justice Initiatives at the Center for Policing Equity. Uh, Dr. Kazee was the first ever Deputy Commissioner of Equity and Inclusion for the NYPD and an advisor to the Police Commissioner on Workforce Diversity. Uh, she was Director of the National Initiative of Building Community Trust and Justice, a project of President Obama's Department of Justice and John Jay College, uh, which was designed to improve relationships and increase trust between minority communities uh, and the criminal justice system. Dr. Kazee is a retired 25-year veteran of the Denver Police Department and a graduate of the FBI National Academy. And as you can tell from hearing about her incredible record of service, we could think of no better person uh, to guide this important conversation with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kazee. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Nicole, for really keeping the energy going in the room. So thank you so much. I am joined today um, by what I consider to be fellow nerds. I'm gonna do a quick introduction of them before we get started. But really the conversation today is about data. Um, and it's a conversation we typically don't like having because it's uncomfortable. Some of us don't understand it. And like me, I flunk statistics. So it becomes very problematic. So one of the things we wanna do today is get these questions out for you all as you're making decisions through this reimagining process that most of us are going through. But we also know data is key and it's key in a number of areas. So without further ado, let me tell you who's in the room with us today. And I'm just gonna have them sort of raise their hands so you know who where they are and where they're at. I'm gonna start with Rosanna Ander. Rosanna Ander is the founder and executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Um, we got some great questions for you. So we were up all night getting these things together, Rosanna. So you're good to go. Um, Sherrod Goyle, assistant professor of management science and engineering, Stanford University and the Stanford Open Policing Project. Um, Marissa Hugh Weller, Senior Director of Justice Reform Initiative for Microsoft, and Lynn Overman, Senior Data Strategist for Opportunity Insights. So we've got some heavy hitters in the room. Let's get started with that. So we know that recently, you know, with all of the events that are going on, we are really starting to think about how do we use data to help inform decisions? And to do that, it means that we have to start connecting dots. I'm going to ask this first question and it's for all of our panelists. And I just want you to, you know, give us a response and then we'll move on. But how can data collection and transparency contribute to furthering civil liberties, particularly for those most unjustly and negatively affected by policing? And I'm going to start with Rosanna. Oh, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. I, I think that is the question. Let's just be very honest. Data are people, their lives, their experiences. And I think one of the real things that has been brought into sharpest relief with recent events is the fact that the people who need to hold their government accountable have the hardest time getting access to that data. 
Um, and so I think it is fundamentally important that we democratize data, that we find ways to push out the data and the information into the hands of people who are being most adversely affected by both you know, the failures of government, whether it's through uh, experiencing the mass incarceration challenge or challenges like gun violence. And so I think it is really, really important that, that we collectively find ways to ensure that that data gets into the hands of the people whose lives are most directly affected. Thank you, Rosanna. And you, you mentioned the data democratization, which is a movement all in itself. So I really appreciate it. Um, Sharad, same question. Um, yeah, and also just to echo, I'm really, really happy to be here. It's great to, great to talk with all you folks. Um, so we've been pushing in our work kind of three theories of change for how we use data to um, improve outcomes on the ground. So the first is partnering with media organizations and community groups to give them the type of statistics that I think many people feel they already know these things, but but having that that statistical evidence that they can point to often um, it just helps reiterate the, the weight of their claims. The, the second is working directly with the police departments and mayor's offices to uh, design alternative policies. So for example, we work with the Nashville Police Department and there, in, in based on a series of conversations, we realized that their theory of policing was, revolved around this idea that, that stopping people for relatively low level, non-moving violations, think broken taillights, was actually effective at reducing higher level crime like burglary. And once we understood that, we directly went to the data, we tested this, this theory and we found basically no evidence for that, for that theory of policing. And when we presented this to, to the mayor's office, to the police department, they actually changed their policies. And again, I wanna say this was in conjunction with a lot of other, other partners, including community groups. So when they saw this evidence, they changed their policies and they had about a 75% reduc reduction in police contact the following year. And then the third way that, that we use data to, to drive these impacts is partnering with uh, legal advocacy organizations like the ACLU. And so here we partnered with the ACLU in Chicago to understand patterns of policing at the Chicago Police Department and in particular to establish these, these um, uh, claims of disparate impact. And so there's this idea there that, you know, were, were, were there even problems that rose to the level of, of legal noncompliance and the statistical analysis helped establish that that case. So these are just three different ways in which we've been using data to, to push outcomes on the ground. Now, the last thing I want to say is that I'm kind of occupationally required to like data and to like data analysis. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important not to um, kind of over measure, over, over scientize this problem. In many cases, we know what the issues are. And I don't want a lack of data to be the bottleneck for driving real reform. I love it when we have data and I love it when we can use data to inform decisions. But in many cases, we already know what to do. And I think we just have to take action and do it right away as opposed to you know, look and doing all this kind of sophisticated analysis, which at the end of the day might still get us to the exact same place. Thanks. Thank you, Sherrod, and, and thank you for lifting up the fact that we don't have to wait to move and to act, so I appreciate it. Marissa, same question for you. So thank you for, for having me. Um, I love your framing about, you know, it feels like we're in a safe space with fellow data nerds, um, <laughs> especially on the verge of a holiday week, so great to be here. Especially, I want to say hi to Mayor Sweet in Kirkland, because I am, as a Microsoft person, just a stone's throw away in Bellevue, so hello, nice to see you. Um, this is a great question. As you might imagine, there's a huge bias at a tech company to just really want to wallow in data. And as someone who is at a tech company, but is a lawyer, I have a kind of a bias for, yeah, but so what? <laughs> what do we learn from the data? Um, and I think that uh, I loved, Rosanna, your you know formulation of democratization of data access, because I firmly believe in that as well. And ironically, what I've discovered from working with, you know, nonprofit organizations and talking with uh, government agencies as well is that everyone is data feels really opaque to pretty much everybody, even those who hold the data themselves. So there's the collection piece, there's a transparency piece. And what I like to focus on and what we do in our work is kind of, well, what are the meaningful insights you actually derive from the data. It's not enough to just have it and then release it to the public or to whomever, but what are you actually learning from it? And that's where I think some you know, interesting tools like visualizations can come into, uh, can be really helpful. I think about the work we did with the Vera Institute 
on their arrest trends data and learning that you know every three seconds in the United States we arrest somebody and where what are we arresting people for 95 plus percent are for low level nonviolent offenses and there's significant disproportionality in that if you're black you're 2.39 times more likely to be arrested for those low level um, offenses um, but I also think a significant piece that I love that we're going to get to talk about today is well that's great but then how do you drill down at a community level because I think as we all know reform is inherently hyper local so it's great to see you know trends at a national level but unless we're able to really work with prosecuting attorneys offices police departments mayor's offices etc we won't actually see the change that we want so my connecting the dots has kind of been this learning of which is obvious when you say it out loud national trends are great but we need to really partner at a local level to you know move the needle even though it seems um rather um detailed and well if you go jurisdiction by jurisdiction you know there's tens of thousands of police departments in the united states for example um gosh that seems like a lot of work yeah but to do meaningful change it needs to be customized to a specific community so i think there's a lot of power for data to show us things at the national level but then really be able to drill down on demography and trends and things like that locally so i will stop talking now thank you Musa, and thank you for lifting up that criminal justice is local. It is, policing is very local. So I appreciate that. Um, Lynn, you are not last okay. but not least because I- I know, I thank you so much. It's great. You. I get to go after so many um, excellent friends and colleagues and, and just want to echo everything that they've already said. I, I do want to emphasize a couple of key points that we've learned. One is transparency is so critical to legitimacy. So however people consume information, whether it's data, whether it's dashboards, whether it's stories, um, understanding what uh, actions are being taken in their community, understanding where they might wanna push on things, understanding how they can get answers to questions is really critical um, as we're thinking about what are the things that we can do to improve trust between police and the communities that they serve. So I, I, there's, a, I think, a lot of work that remains in that space. I also want to point to, and this obviously kind of tees up some of the work that we were able to do in the Obama administration, but in addition to understanding kind of policing in relation to other components of the criminal justice system, I think Marissa makes a great point. It's really critical to connect to prosecutors, to judges, to probation officers, to jails. We don't have a good grasp on how people move through systems. We don't have a good grasp on, on how people are provided services or treatment if they are while they're in the criminal justice system. Um, but more critically, we know that there are folks that are moving through these systems that have a wide range of other needs that are not at all ever going to be met by the criminal justice system. And how do we think about policing in particular in the context of other community systems? I think we all share the goal of trying to identify the different ways that we can reduce contacts with law enforcement, that we can make those contacts safer for everyone involved. But really understanding what is the array of resources in the community? How do we understand how people are interacting with those? Um, and how can data help local communities understand what alternatives might exist if we want to move from a world where we know too many people are coming into contact with the police and move them to a world where other systems can start to address some of the challenges that we're seeing. Thank you, Lynn. And that brings up to, you know, the public health perspective in all of this as well. So thank you for lifting it up. I'm going to stay with you because we're going to get to the business at hand. So in regards to data. So during your time at the Data Driven Justice, um, you worked with Cambridge PD um, and collected data. And there were some interesting findings. If you can share with us without you know, using identifiers, what types of things did you find? And then what does it mean for the mayors and the elected officials that we have here and even our law enforcement um, folks that we have on, on screen with us today as well? Yeah, so I'll just do a, a quick 30 second description of what DDJ was. Um, we started at the end of the Obama administration and then continued it for a few years afterwards. It still lives at Arnold Ventures and I would encourage folks who are interested in learning more to go there. But what we really, what we really is, uh, kind of recognized the core of DDJ was that folks who were experiencing mental health crisis, who were experiencing drug overdose or who were experiencing street homelessness were far too often falling into our criminal justice system. Um, and that the moment of crisis and when people were in crisis could be very risky for everyone involved. 
So we start off by looking at data. We looked at some, some key facts um, and a couple really stuck out to us nationally. Again, we started nationally and then really drilled down locally. So 25% of all fatal officer involved shootings um, involve people with mental illness. We started looking at our local jail populations. We realized that 64% of people in local jails suffered from mental illness. 68% have a substance use disorder. More than 50% have a chronic health problem and more than 15% were homeless within the last year. So we really have a population of people in our jails that are struggling with some very complex issues. And I think anyone who's been in law enforcement or has worked in jails knows that these settings are not the right settings to address any of those issues, even though we know our jails do the best that they can. So while the dream state is that we move upstate, we get preventative, we're connecting people to services and systems that make it so that they don't cycle into crisis, they aren't experiencing homelessness, and they get treatment, uh, we saw a real moment of opportunity to leverage kind of that, that intervention, that, uh, that moment of call to 911 for help or the street encounter with law enforcement to do something different. So how do we actually look at those moments when people are coming into contact with, the, with police departments or with EMTs and divert them away from the criminal justice system and towards more effective treatment? So we started working with a, a, a number of communities. Actually, there were about 146 communities that joined the initiative over the course of the time that we worked on it. Uh, but Cambridge Police came to us with some really, really fascinating data that I think is both a little bit of an outlier, but I think a good example of what we were struggling with or what local communities were struggling with. Um, so I'll talk to you just briefly about Joe J. This is obviously not his real name, but Joe J was experiencing um, street homelessness. He was a veteran. He had suffered a traumatic brain injury and he had serious chronic alcoholism. So Cambridge police partnered with Cambridge EMT and they just pulled their information on Joe Jay to try to get a grip on what was happening because all of the frontline officers knew Joe and knew what his problems were. They found that in the course of one year, the Cambridge PD had 116 encounters with Joe, only one arrest. They weren't arresting him, but they were called out to help him 116 times. Uh, and he was transported to a hospital emergency room 264 times. He actually had an average of three transports uh, every four days. And when we looked at that data with the Cambridge PD and with the Cambridge policymakers, what we learned was the problem for Joe was not that our frontline responders weren't doing what they could. The real problem in that system, and I think this is true of many systems, was that they didn't have the right place to take Joe to actually get him the treatment that he needed. So not arresting him was a great first step, but not arresting alone is insufficient. Hospital transport was not doing the job either. And eventually what they were able to do for Joe was get him into a long-term treatment program uh, and get him stable housing. So that was a great example of using data to kind of understand what the pain points may be in the community and what policies you might want to implement. Another example I'll give from a neighboring town of Arlington, Massachusetts, uh, when they just looked at their 911 calls for service, they found that 81% of their mental health related calls were coming from one group home that served teenage girls. So while the example with Joe is a great way of showing when you look at data, sometimes the solution is clear. We needed something different than jail or hospital. For Arlington, Massachusetts, I don't, we didn't know what the, the problem, or we didn't know what the solution was, but we knew that there was a major problem because obviously we don't want that many calls for service coming from a home that's intended to be helping higher risk girls. And then finally, just the one other place I'd love to point to from a local community perspective, um, many folks may know that Allegheny County, Pennsylvania has some of the best integrated data systems in the country. Uh, and they use their data in a way that I think everyone would love to. And I would also love to point to as a great use of data across systems. Every community that I've ever worked with is resource constrained. Um, there is a limited number of services to kind of provide to folks who really need them. And that matchmaking process of figuring out which services work most effectively for which high needs clients and how do you actually prioritize who gets those services was something that Allegheny was able to do. So they actually looked through the data-driven justice lens to, uh, to understand which of their highest cost services. So they were looking at their housing first programs, which are uh, housing services for homelessness, which include wraparound services and realized uh, by analyzing their own data, they were actually sending the folks to that to those high resources that weren't benefiting as much. So what they found were younger folks, people in their early 20s, 
um, in Allegheny County for some reason seem to benefit and do much better when they receive those services. So they actually uh, changed the way that they prioritize folks to receive them and are seeing much better results for those young people in achieving stability and staying out of criminal justice engagement. Thank you, Len, and, and what incredible examples of what you can do when you take the data and, and really sort of dig deep. Rosanna, I wanna continue this conversation. Um, so it's not just about you know, the data, it is um, how do we think about using it? So as we are all going through this reimagining work, one of the things I know my colleagues in policing will tell you is that it feels as if other sectors of government have abdicated their work to policing, that they are called for everything and don't have the tools to do what they need to do. And we find ourselves really in this moment um, in regards to defund the police. And so how can this moment we find ourselves in today help us rethink and reimagine the scaling of police departments and using data? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a really important question, right? You know, when you think about by the time, and, and Lynn did a beautiful job of really underscoring that, by the time police get called, there have been multiple systems failures. I, so I have a public health background. And, you know, in so many ways, we have sort of um, done away with any sort of safety net or infrastructure that is sort of a front end preventive or early intervention system. And then we send police officers in with, surely not enough training, not the right tools uh, to solve problems that that really are fundamentally, um, in many cases, not really policing or even public safety challenges. And so I think um, what I what I personally hope comes out of the, the very painful moment that we're in, and it's not just a moment, it's, you know, hundreds of years of history that have led up to this, um, let's be honest, um, is that we really don't start and end by looking at police only, that we really do think about what are all the ways that systems need to change what they do and how they do it, how they're transparent, how they're accountable, so that in the reimagined policing conversation, um, we can really think about what is the role that police or public safety uh, agents of government um, are best positioned to play and what are the roles that other parts of, of government need to play? And maybe I'll just give you one very specific example. You know, I, I don't just work on uh, crime and criminal justice. I also get to work uh, on education issues. And it is very, very clear that there's a sort of pathway that young people uh, end up on where there are lots of earlier signs that a young person, a family is struggling and needs something different from its government and from the school system. Um, and I think it is not uh, as often as it should be the case that we respond effectively when we see that earlier indication that that something is not going going well for that family. And then we kind of, the kid ends up no longer in the school system and unfortunately uh, too often ends up either uh, with justice system contacts or worse yet ends up, uh, you know, in, involved in gun violence. And so I think we really do, I think need to take the moment where there, there is a Klieg light, a sharp focus on policing and really uh, open up the aperture more and understand um, how can government writ large really be reimagined so that it, we can get um, better, better outcomes for all of our citizens, but most um, acutely for black and brown um, communities of color that I think have, you know, borne the sort of burden of the failures of the system as it's currently constructed. Thank you, Rosanna. And there's something to be said about reimagining government. So not just reimagining policing, reimagining government and public safety. So I, I really do appreciate that. Sherrod, the Stanford Policing Project reminds us that a typical day, there's probably about 50,000 traffic stops that are made. And I know that your team is, has been really integral in, in analyzing those things and making sure you bring them to light. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What's the data shown? Um, and based on this, what mayors, what can mayors, I should say, and elected officials and law enforcement leaders that are listening to you, what should they know and what should they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, so it's a really good question. I mean, the, the first thing, just this existence of this project, 
shows that the, the state of, of available data on policing is not great. I think it's a little bit better now than it was when we started. But when we started this project about six years ago, um, the reason we started it is because we really couldn't find anything at scale across the country that let us investigate patterns of policing. Um, so over the next six, seven years, we filed public records requests with over 150 departments across the country. I would say our hit rate was about 50% where we could get usable records back. So even that statistic in and of itself tells you that a lot of departments either don't collect the data, they don't collect it in digital form, or even when they do collect it in digital form, sometimes they were just um, unwilling to give it to us. And so all of these hurdles meant that we really could only get information on even half of the places that we tried to get information from. Um, then the second kind of big takeaway is that is that the patterns that we're seeing are really widespread and quite systematic all across the country. And so one might think, you know, it's like even I, like if I'm sort of being honest with myself, I might think, oh, well, in San Francisco, you know, maybe we're better than other parts of the country. And it's like, well, actually it all looks kind of the same. There's, there's definitely variation, but it's not like, you know, it's like any place we look and across all of these jurisdictions, we found quite serious problematic um, evidence of widespread bias. And so this isn't something that's just uh, uh, that one particular region or one particular city has to deal with. It's something that all of us have to deal with all across the country. And then I would say the final kind of take on going back to this question of what can we do about it? Um, I think we really need to understand what are our goals and, and how are those aligned with our actions? So in, in many cases, there's just this culture of policing in many cases for like relatively low level offenses like non-moving violations, again, think broken taillights. That's actually quite common all across the country. And the question is, why are we doing that? Um, and I would say in, in at least in many cases, it's probably because we fall into a habit of policing. We've deployed officers to certain neighborhoods. And when you're in a neighborhood, you have to do something or you feel like you have to do something. Um, or maybe there's, uh, maybe you're even promoted for being an, a quote unquote active officer. There are other kind of incentives for having this type of, of response. But really, why are we doing it? Like if the idea is stopping people for these low level offenses, even if there's not a ticket that results, and that's something that we've heard time and time again, we're stopping them, we're not getting a ticket, we're just talking to them. Even those low level interactions can lead to lots of problems. And so unless there's a very good reason for doing it, I think the simplest first step is just stop doing it. Unless you have a clearly articulated theory, the evidence suggests that this is not an effective way for reducing many of these higher level public safety concerns that I believe many police departments are trying to address. And so it's just that we've, we've mismatched our tool with the problem. And so just being very careful and, and conscientious about matching that response to a problem that I think many of us you know, want to address, we want to improve public safety, but making sure we're using the right tools for, for the issues that we face. Thank you for that. And I, and I appreciate that insight. Marissa, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so Microsoft is a tech company. A lot of folks are just wondering, um, the, sort of the question around justice reform initiative in Microsoft. So talk to us about um, how you're interacting with policing data and how are you helping um, to further a lot of this work and when you talk about criminal justice reform. Thanks for the question. It is definitely not the first time I've had that question. Like what? <laughs> Microsoft? Huh? Not the Gates Foundation, not in our philanthropic, you know, group. Um, no, this is this is a big one. So basically starting in 2014, 2015, we started hearing very loudly and clearly from our employees and especially our black employees that racial equity in policing in particular is an issue that impacts our communities. We operate in, you know, a lot of states. <laughs> we operate around the world, but specifically in the U.S., you know, we are ever present. Um, and for our Black employees who get questioned in their own neighborhood or profiled while they're traveling to a Microsoft conference, for example, this is not a um, intellectual exercise. This is a lived experience. Um, and so really at that point is when we started to explore, well, what if anything should we do because it doesn't feel quite, you know, uh, tightly aligned to what we've done previously. Um, 
However, I would say that where we've kind of landed in the last few years is acknowledging that no, Microsoft is not a civil rights social justice organization. That's stating the obvious. Um, but we do know data and we do know technology. And so hmm, maybe that's a place we can lean in a bit more specifically on policing. And then I mentioned the other front end systems. Um, and how I think about our approach is just like we approach any other customer that we have, where we partner with nonprofit organizations like the Vera Institute or Urban, many others, the Obama Foundation, for example, and defer to the nonprofits as they are the true subject matter experts, the police departments we work with, they are the subject matter experts. And we're here to say, how can our tools help you do more, um, reach more communities, unlock more you know, data, meaningful data insights, et cetera. And so that's basically the framework that we've approached this with is like, how do we bring our subject matter expertise to bear on what is a critical and important issue? Um, so I think about, and actually Lynn, when you were talking, I was like, oh, this is great. It's a perfect segue into what I was hoping to talk about, which is like, well, what does this look like on the ground? Like, how do we actually implement our values in this way? And I think about, there's several examples, but one that's specific to where I am in King County uh, near Seattle is working on diversion with the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. And they actually came to us with the, our, the prosecutor saying, you know, right now our process is basically manual as we try to refer an individual into the program or do some you know, information sharing across police, prosecutors and social services what we could really use is a tool um, to do that in an automated way. We could serve more people and also provide those kind of more real-time data insights into what's effective and what's not. And so we did. So we helped them, you know, build basic, almost like a CRM, I suppose. Um, and what we're excited about is trying to see how we can do that in other communities. So the law enforcement assist lead, basically, they're now wanting to go deep in, I think, at least six other communities outside Washington State. And we are going, we're going shoulder to shoulder with them to help them do that. Um, and again, I want to caveat it by saying, building a tool will not solve any problems <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, just like throwing technology at things tends to not be a perfect solution. However, I do think there is a huge role for tech companies, including ours, to play in the democratization of data insights, in thinking how, you know, how can we accomplish digital transformation for so many organizations that are under-resourced and underfunded and they're where the need is great. Um, so I guess that's my uh, implicit invitation to please talk to me if you have some ideas of what you want to do, because that is what, yes, thank you. CRM in the chat, client relationship management system. Like how do you track all of these cases. When I refer Marisa Hewell,er into lead, and then she gets treatment for, you know, um, addiction. Which service providers were the most, you know, effective in helping me um, change my trajectory? So thank you for that in the chat. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marissa, and thank you for answering my other question around how do you see those partnerships playing out on the ground, and you gave a great example of that, so I absolutely appreciate it. Rosanna, I want to go back to you real quick, and a large part of the work that you do at the University of Chicago and the Crime Lab is to figure out ways to make criminal justice data more accessible to individuals, um, and, and this is what you were sort of touching on, on the democratization of that data. And so how does your team do that? What types of you know, things do you take into consideration when you're trying to make that accessible, um, especially to communities who are not scientists? Yeah, no, that's a really important question. Um, I'm not a scientist, actually. I, I have a public health background and I also myself don't work with data. Um, so I think it's really important to have the end user in mind when you think about this. It, you know, who cares if we can build all these sophisticated tools if community residents can't glean useful insights or if you're not using it to answer their questions? Who cares what my questions are? It really matters what their questions are. So we spend a lot of time working with nonprofits and also community organizations and residents to really start with what is it that they want to know the answer to? Are there even data? that could be pulled in to try to um, generate some insights. And so they really 
in some ways co-design or in many ways co-design the end product. So um, one, um, I think one of the better examples is um, unfortunately Chicago, like many other cities, has experienced just extraordinary um, uh, increases in gun violence. We had that happen in 2016 and again um, this year. And the, I think the good news is the city has started to invest in some non-law enforcement responses um, as a complement to what the police do to try to really respond to and, and try to stop the cycle of gun violence that we're experiencing. Um, and it seemed crazy to us that the police department had real-time data, things like ShotSpotter and other data that they could use to you know, inform where they place their resources. And yet you have these incredible community organizations who are out there willing to risk their lives um, and try to support uh, residents and, and neighborhoods who were in many ways flying blind or having to only rely on, on their own firsthand knowledge and experience. So we um, really pushed the city and the police department to let us build a dashboard that was co-designed by them, where they told us what they needed. They told us how they wanted to see the data. And, and it's really a sort of build your own adventure dashboard in some sense. So um, they can sort of manipulate the data and, and look at it in ways where they get to define how, how they want to look at it, which geographic areas, which types of incidents um, over what period of time. And I think um, more and more of that needs to happen. You know, I'll, I'll go out even further on a limb and say, you know, it, it is, it seems crazy that information is viewed as law enforcement sensitive, like how many officers are deployed to a neighborhood? Why can we not find a way at the aggregate to make sure that community residents know how many officers are assigned to their neighborhood? Um, and so I think there's a lot more of building that information, but it really does have to be done both with the sort of end user in mind, um, who is often not gonna be a data scientist. Um, and then furthermore, in ways that they understand what data is being plugged in, because I think there's a lot of, um, legitimate questions and concern about how, what the definitions are. Are you comparing apples to apples um, if you compare Chicago's data on this particular outcome to another city? So I think really being clear about how you're defining what this data element is and transparent um, so that people can make their own mind up about how they want to interpret it. Um, and so, you know, I think that is a area of work that I hope cities really do take up is thinking about every piece of data they have and are there ways to make it you know, useful to community residents um, uh, in ways that you know, actually um, are, are responsible. Obviously we have to be sensitive to individual identity and, and you know, privacy and all of those concerns, but I think there is a way uh, to balance those concerns with also pushing out a lot more information than we currently do. Um, Thank you for that, Rosanna. And, and I'm going to touch on a little bit the fact that you say, well, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I'm going to go to Lynn <laughs> because we often do this when we get to data. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's happening here. Um, and Lynn, you began, you started your career as a public defender. Um, and, um, you know, then you were a civil rights attorney. And this is, of course, before you joined the Obama administration. Can you talk to us? How did you prepare yourself for this work today? Because your fellow data nerds here are coming from all different perspectives. <laughs> but we know that data does provide so many, so much direction and information. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I think, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a technologist, um, but I do. I have learned the power and the value of data. And I think I actually knew that even when I was a public defender. So at the end of the day, what we're talking about is how do you get the information you need to understand what's happening and how do you in, my, in that role, I was advocating, right? How do I use the information that I had to advocate on behalf of my client or to change the, uh, the kind of policies and procedures that we were um, attacking or addressing as we were doing the civil rights lawsuits. I will also say, I think there's a, a plug and, and Tracy, I think you fit and a, a number of my colleagues on this call fit this, this really well too, which is if you've worked in the systems that you're trying to change, I think you just have a fundamentally different perspective on the opportunities and the challenges. Um, and I will say one of the things that was most surprising to me after I left public defender world and joined uh, kind of the world of policy and then got into the world of data, um, I, I found myself working very closely with police chiefs over the years. Um, ironically, the very same departments that I would sue with some frequency because we had a, a pretty significant problem with use of force um, in Miami-Dade where I was practicing. Um, 
And I think one of the things that I learned in the criminal justice system as a practitioner and as a practitioner whose job it was to represent the people who had the least power in the system, um, a lot of the folks in the system recognized the problems, right? It wasn't, no one was blind to the challenges that we were facing. Uh, there's a lot of really creative and smart solutions that come from the systems themselves. So while there's certainly a lot that we have to do to take on the status quo and to change, um, some of the best ideas that you can get were, are going to come from the people who know those systems really well. So I think there's, um, you know, we call it, who is our end user? Who are we trying to influence? But um, recognizing the expertise and the knowledge that comes from the community themselves and the systems themselves, I think, is a really valuable perspective. Um, I think one other thing, you know, from a civil rights and civil liberties perspective that is, I think is an ongoing struggle that we really have to pay attention to, Rosanna mentioned it, is really being hyper, hyper sensitive about privacy and security, particularly as we're talking about sharing criminal justice data with other systems. So any public health systems or services systems, um, we've certainly seen how much trust can be lost if those systems are perceived, even if they're not actually being used um, by law enforcement. So when we first started DDJ, one of the first questions we would get is, well, I'm, we can't have police officers looking through our records as to who has a mental health problem or who has a drug addiction problem. Um, and so being very clear from the outset that the data sharing, being kind of very transparent around the, how that works, law enforcement data goes to these other systems. It does not go back. Law enforcement can't go looking for folks. And frankly, none of the law enforcement partners I ever worked with wanted that information. They're not looking for it. They don't want to have to be the ones that are responding in these circumstances. Um, but the creating very clear, bright lines about who sees the data, for what purpose, and at what level. At some point, we really do need to get down to individual level data so that folks are actually getting the treatment and services that they need. But we also have to be very careful about who can see what. Um, law enforcement doesn't need to see individuals, but they may benefit a great deal from, to Rosanna's point earlier, or from Sherrod's work, where are we deploying our officers? Are we deploying them, the right kinds of officers? Is there another way that we could respond to this problem that we're seeing? Aggregate data can be incredibly helpful to law enforcement agencies for policymaking decisions, but the individual level data has to be very, very closely held. Um, so Thank I you. think- that component of trust and legitimacy that we talked about at the beginning really does have to be being hyper, hyper sensitive and very thoughtful about protecting data so that people feel confident that it's being used to benefit people and not to um, kind of create enforcement actions against them. Thank you so much. And I know, Rosanna, you wanted to, to jump in on that, but we have to wrap up. And I have one question I want to round robin you all before we go into Q&A because I want to give time for that. So again, thank you all to our panelists who have been um, really good about talking about not just data, data collection, the challenges and transparency. So I'm going to go to each one of you. Um, and here's my question for you. For our mayors, our elected officials, for our law enforcement friends who are on this call, what do you hope they will do from today? What do you hope they will do? And so Rosanna, I'll let you answer that. And then I'm going to go around to the rest of, of the team as well. You know, I think, unfortunately, our cities are facing bigger challenges and, and have fewer resources. So I do think that data can be an enormously powerful tool to help you allocate those resources in ways that are equitable and also hold you accountable for what you are supposed to do for the people who elected you. So I think really doing a sort of top to bottom audit of where could you be unafraid and willing to push out much more data and information with all of the protections that Lynn mentioned um, in ways that give the residents more power um, and more insight on, on what's going on, but also allow you to get more impact for the resources you're spending. There's all kinds of both gaps in services, but also duplication that we can't see because we are only ever looking at these things in silos. So I just think jump in, but but do it with, with the right guardrails. Thank you, Sherrod. Yeah, I guess two two quick points. The first is that I, you know, it'd be great to have more data available, more transparency. I think that's something probably all of us agree about in theory and practice. It's challenging, but I think it's important. And then the second point is to recognize that data 
are a, a means to an end, not an end in and of themselves. And so again, I don't want the take home to be our next step is to get our data infrastructure in place and, and release more data. Our goal is reform. And so I would hope that everybody recognizes the places where we need data and the places where we really can just tomorrow go out and start changing things and not worry about collecting more data before making those changes. Thank you for that, Marissa. Thank you. Um, this has been such a fun conversation. I think um, my call to action or like, what would I want folks to do on this call is really think about this data movement as you're not alone. Uh, there are significant partners who are available to you and to like crib from, I think it was the CEO of MasterCard riffing on a proverb of like, you know, to go far, go together, you know, go, to go wide, go with government, to go deep, go with nonprofits and academic institutions, to go fast, go with the private sector, but to go far, go together. Um, and I think that's very true in this space where none of us in a silo can do what we want to do in terms of like far reaching generational change. Um, so that would be one of mine. And then like a specific one is to look out uh, in the spring of 2021 for some really great work that Data Foundation is going to be doing to infuse community sentiment uh, survey data with um, disparate sources of policing data knit together, including Sherrod, the open policing project data. Um, to try to see like, how do we actually infuse reform conversations with what the community needs? Um, so keep your eye on that, or you can follow me because I'll definitely post about it. But yeah, I just think the whole notion of like, we need both, we need private sector, we need nonprofit, we need government, we need to go together in order, I think, to do this really well. Um, and that I know, at least on the private sector side, there's just a lot of appetite to be helpful Thank you so much. And Lynn, I'm going to have you take us home before I turn it over to Nicole. Great. I would love to end us on a point. I think it was Sherrod made earlier, but I think we've all made separately. Um, we also have to be very careful not to just flock to where the data is yeah. um, and to recognize that the data that exists is in inherently incredibly biased. So the data that we currently have reflects the policies that have been implemented in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and we are missing entire gaps of knowledge and information because we've over-policed certain communities and dramatically under-policed others. So, you know, I think it's always really important to acknowledge, um, real, and not, even, not only acknowledge, but just from the outset say, here's the data that we have. Here's probably the extent that we can learn from it. Here's what we don't have. I love Sherrod's point. That is not an excuse not to take action, but we also shouldn't over-index on the data that we currently have. Um, I also do want to say um, the communities really are expert um, in coming up with solutions that are probably going to be more effective than what we're currently doing. I would, um, in addition to the quantitative data that we've been talking about a lot, and there's huge value in qualitative data that I think gets underemphasized amount. So what, how do we get much better about meaningful engagement with communities about how they can be better served? meaningful engagements about resources that they may need and what that can look like and how those may be effective. Um, I feel like qualitative kind of is the, uh, the, the redheaded stepchild at the table sometimes. And I think such, such incredible projects can come when we really start thinking about um, different kinds of data or, or recognizing that data has a piece and a part to play, but is, is definitely not the end point. And thank you for closing us out. And I am with you. So those lived experiences are very powerful and those who are data. Um, I think we just have to be mindful about how many times we ask for people to share that lived experience. So I wanted to make sure I lift that up.